Okay, hello, um, and um, welcome to uh, the first of a series of three webinars taking place uh, in collaboration, collaboration with the DMSA um, as part of the project Post-Socialist Britain, Memory, Representation and Identity Among German, Polish and Ukrainian Immigrants in the UK. Uh, I'm Sarah Jones uh, from the University of Birmingham, and I'm Principal Investigator for that project. Um, so our project explores um, what happens to the connection between memory and identity in the context of migration, um, specifically for, uh, migration from countries um, that have experienced of state socialism to the UK. Um, so we started this project in 2021, in January 2021, um, with two very different but comparable case studies, um, migration from Germany and migration from Poland to the UK. Um, and then we made the decision last year to add um, an additional case study that is migration from Ukraine. Um, so in the process of exploring the identities uh, and memories of movers to the UK, um, conceptually, we also want to consider the ways in which Britain itself uh, can be understood as post-socialist. Um, so British society, we argued, is, is, is made up of the people that live here. Um, and a large minority of those residents uh, have lived memories and experiences of socialism and post-socialism. Um, but more than that, um, the communist or socialist and capitalist worlds um, and non-aligned worlds were not completely separate from each other during um, the period of the Cold War, um, but intertwined. And the collapse of one system inevitably brings changes um, to the other, including changes in migratory flows. Um, so we would argue that post-socialism needs to be thought of temporarily um, as well as spatially um, and in the context of what Sherry and Verdery describe as the post-Cold War, um, that is thinking between the posts of post-socialism and post-colonialism. Um, so the purpose of this webinar series is to set our research um, in dialogue with and, and, and in discussion with work being done in similar or related fields um, and also on and in um, different contexts. Um, so I'm really pleased um, that we've got three very exciting papers today that, that do exactly that. Um, the first is by uh, Dimitra Gitska, uh, Gitska represent, uh, the title of which is Representation of Albanian Immigrants in British and Greek Media. Um, Dimitra is an Alexander Nash Research Fellow in Albanian Studies at the School of Slavonic and East European Studies uh, at the University College London. Her research is situated at the intersection of memory studies, effect, activism, contemporary art and curatorial practices uh, and post-socialist visual cultures, uh, with a particular focus on the geopolitical region of Southeast Europe. Um, her doctoral thesis with the title Affecting Commoning, uh, Effective Commoning, Collective Curating in Post-Socialist Space, examined art collectives and collaborative practices in Albania, Serbia and North Macedonia. Uh, her current project researches the legacy of post-industrialism in Albania. Um, we then have a paper by two members of our project team, Marin Roa and Charlotte Gerpin, uh, with a slightly changed title, which is the role of historical memory in media narratives of German and Polish migrants in Britain. Marin uh, is a postdoctoral research fellow on the project, um, uh, the project Post-Socialist Britain, uh, her research analyzes national and transnational identities in the context of migration, intercultural contacts and othering. Um, her regional focus is on Central and Eastern Europe and she's conducted research on Germany, Poland, Belarus, Ukraine and Russia. Um, her work on the project has been on our narratives and media strands. Um, in the former, she's been conducting one-to-one -one interviews with German migrants living in the UK and in the latter, which is the subject of the paper today, she and Charlotte have been exploring the representation of, uh, of the history and migration uh, from Germany and Poland in the UK press. Um, Charlotte is Associate Professor in German and European Politics at the University of Birmingham. Uh, her research lies at the intersection of political science, sociology and media and communication studies with a particular interest in the European public sphere. European and national identity and EU citizenship. Um, more recently, she's analyzing gendered patterns of inclusion, exclusion in European debates. Um, and she's co-investigator on the Post-Socialist Britain project um, and lead for the media strand. 
Um, her book, Euro Crisis and European Identities, Political and Media Discourse in Germany, Ireland and Poland, appeared in 2017. Uh, and she's now also working on her second monograph funded by the Lieberholm Trust with the title, uh, provisional title, Gendering Europe, British National Identity from EEC Accession to EU Secession. Um, and last but certainly not least, we have Shvela Dronozhek Zorko, sorry Shvela, I did practice Shvela Dronozhek Zorko with the title Towards a Post-Socialist Politics of Presence. Um, Shvela is a Henrietta Hertz Fellow in the Centre for Advanced Studies, um, Dialogical Cultures at the Catholic University Eichstätt Ingolstadt, uh, where she is working on a book exploring questions of travelling memory global local racializations and post-socialist imaginaries. After obtaining her PhD in anthropology at SOAS, uh, University of London, uh, she held a Lieberholm Trust Early Career Fellowship at the University of Warwick, researching post-socialist and post-colonial encounters through the lens of Central and Eastern European migration to the UK. Um, her work on intergenerational post-Yugoslav narratives and post-socialist migrants' articulations of race and, co race and coloniality uh, has appeared in journals including Ethnic and Racial Studies, Comparative Migration Studies, and the Sociological Review. Um, so as you can see, we've got a great set of speakers and some exciting papers that, that really hang together. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over uh, first to Dimitra uh, uh, Gitsa uh, to speak on the representation of Albanian immigrants in British and Greek media. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone see my, my slides? Yeah, perfect. So thank you very much. Um, it's, I'm really pleased to uh, present my work within the frameworks of this webinar, um, especially because uh, somehow uh, the sociopolitical uh, reality, the memory, the history of Albania is somehow forgotten when we speak about uh, the post-socialist and the socialist realities and histories. So um, I would like to um, um, start my uh, presentation today with uh, um, this uh, graph, simply uh, to remind ourselves that um, despite the vast uh, media reports that present in a way uncontrollable numbers of uh, immigrants coming from uh, former um, East, um, uh, socialist countries to, to the UK, um, in fact, when we see the larger picture, um, in essence, other European countries, uh, mainly like Northern Europe, uh, remain um, the vast majority uh, of people who migrate into the UK. Um, then um, and another um, um, interesting aspect is that these statistics also show that, uh, in fact, people migrate to work and to study, uh, both activities that are actually essential and beneficial to the UK's economy. Um, and uh, further uh, data from the Office of National Statistics also notes that immigrants from Central and Eastern Europe are also the workers that, although are occupied in labor that requires longer hours, um, they somehow still earn lower hourly wages. So this means that migrant workforces um, coming particularly from um, um, Eastern uh, and Southeastern Europe, um, remains what uh, Francois Verger calls uh, in her article on capitalism, waste uh, and trace, the exhausted bodies that in a way clean, construct, uh, build, maintain, take care of land, and in a way uh, maintain and operate um, our, our neoliberal cities and towns. And yet these already exhausted migrant bodies receive further attention and discrimination uh, on media and political uh, discourse that further establish and institutionalize the migrant identities in terms of their otherness. So how is the sense of identity and belonging developed in migration, especially in settings where migrants have to deal with racism, xenophobia, stereotypes on a daily basis? More crucially, what is the role of mass media in this process? And perhaps another interesting question would be why this constant obsession on media with the refugee and migrant crisis? 
So um, I have been in England um, nearly 10 years now. Um, just to say a little, uh, a few words about my background as well. I grew up in Greece where my parents um, greeted uh, from Albania in the uh, early 90s. Um, and I was very surprised to see out of the sudden uh, the rise of interest uh, on media um, in the UK being preoccupied uh, with um, um, Albanian uh, immigrants. Um, that um, um, and I'm I'm uh, showing here the number the, the statistics again not so much because of the numbers, uh, but because this graph has been um, produced and reproduced on media uh, with the title as well um, a number of uh, small boats coming from Albania, and this is essentially. Uh, impossible because boats are never coming from Albania. They are coming per perhaps from, from France or other European countries. But it's interesting the vocabulary here, right? So it's these other massive populations who are coming from the very, very outskirts of, of Europe into uh, our, um, as um, uh, Suella Braveman said, um, the, the southern, invading the southern coast. Um, so um, very quickly, um, I would say that uh, the vast um, characteristics of uh, media reports from uh, October 22 have some very similarities. Um, and in my case as well, like um, growing up in, in Greece and, and being exposed uh, to this media, I was also having like my own deja vu in the sense of like how similar the vocabularies and the stereotypes are, even if we speak about two completely different um, social realities. So we see how uh, firstly media reports concer are concerned with counting Albanian migrants and asylum seekers. Uh, in many cases, these numbers and statistics are not presented, uh, presented comparatively. Uh, showing in a way the larger picture of migration. Uh, the focus as well on the numbers take away the attention from actually understanding migrant experiences, the process and sociopolitical reasons that force large populations to migrate. Um, the majority of these articles and media reports on Albanian migration highlight how they are in fact illegal immigrants, um, how they exploit the asylum system, and such media reports further establish the identity of the Albanian immigrant uh, in relation to illegal activities such as gangs, drugs, violence. Um, the interesting point here is that media uh, construct a reading of Albanian migration as a crisis. Now, this is not new or unique to the Albanian migration. This was also the main rhetoric that was followed uh, describing the flow of refugees in Europe, um, also like the term refugee crisis. Um, in most cases, this crisis is uh, presented as a threat to the state's welfare, uh, and such reports are also accommodated by references to what the UK government is doing to protect its citizens from the crisis. Uh, now, the interesting point here is that this crisis is never about the country from which migrants are escaping or refugees are leaving behind, but it's also a crisis about the countries that are receiving um, migrants. Um, this is um, most progressive media outlets have also tried to present the reasons behind Albanian migration. Um, in their majority, these reports are followed by references to the socialist past that led to, the, to an isolation and generalized crisis after the collapse of state socialism, uh, narratives on Albanians' poverty, which has been further perpetuated by corrupted politics, and also in many cases, also like references to Albanians' blood foods. Now, the problem with such account is that they further project the, the progressive, civilized Western gaze on the uncivilized Balkan states, rather than actually doing a meaningful engagement with uh, that perhaps um, requires a better and closer understanding of that society. Um, this is also like further demonstrated by accounts that build reports on the remittances that Albanians send uh, back to their families. So there are articles, for instance, uh, showing like the villas that um, an Albanian has built with uh, money that made in the UK. Um, and also like um, media highlighting how the majority of Albanian um, migrations are 
in their majority male, um, and as such a bigger threat than women or families. And such accounts are completely ignorant of the Albanian society, the role that men and women have in such a society, as well as the close ties that families have, in which case um, the young, mainly male member of the family bears also the responsibility to provide um, for, for the rest uh, of the family. Um, in, um, in the book, Policing the Crisis, Stuart Hall, um, in collaboration with uh, colleagues from the Birmingham School of Cultural Studies, uh, made a significant contribution in analyzing and understanding the ways in which state power is exercised in the realm of the everyday life, particularly in reference to the role of media in establishing and, and influencing um, um, what, what could be um, uh, characterized as public knowledge. Um, in, um, in this book, uh, they made a particularly uh, research on uh, how street violence in the 70s um, was presented and in a way created a panic uh, using mugging as a racialized crime, which later became closely linked to the anti-immigration and anti-welfare ideologies that made ground for Thatcher's neoliberal politics. Um, and in this uh, quote here, um, they write, uh, the media helped to reproduce and sustain the definitions of the situation which favor the powerful, not only by activating, uh, actively recruiting the powerful in the initial stages where topics are structured, um, but also in maintaining certain strategic areas of silence. Um, unless they write, we deliberately ask what other than what has been said about this topic could be said, what questions are omitted? Why do the questions which always presuppose answers of particular kind so often recur in this form? And most importantly, why do certain other questions uh, never appear? So um, I, I'm making this reference here uh, for two reasons, uh, because it shows in a way that anti-immigration sentiments um, are not new. Uh, and secondly, because the figure of um, the evil criminal um, uh, immigrant appear in relation to certain social political realities that can tell more about the country who produces these rhetorics rather than about the immigrant themselves. Um, and I'm adding here um, this graph, um, which um, shows in a way a Google, a, a Google web search um, by the country where migrants are coming from in the UK. Um, and an interesting question would be um, following uh, perhaps what Stuart Hall uh, mentioned in the previous quote, uh, why the Albanian migrant appeared in the UK media so suddenly in September, 2022. Um, and I think it's also like interesting to, to, to see here perhaps um, the, the rhetoric around Polish and, and for instance, Romanian migrants just after Brexit, um, and then um, references to Albanian immigration showing up when um, England was having its own political um, instability, uh, energy crisis, inflations, um, and I think that's that's an interesting um, moment perhaps to, to take into consideration. Um, now, as I said, although um, Albanian migration is something new and sudden in the UK media, um, it's, uh, it's not a new uh, phenomenon. Um, Ifigenia Kokali, in her article on the invisibility and identity management of Albanian Im immigrants in Greece, um, writes that um, over a period of less than 20 years, their migration to Greece has presented all the classic stages of immigration movement, labor migration of young men, regularization of the migrant statuses, extension to their intended stays, stabilization of the flux with the arrival of women and children, questions of incorporation, and then second generation issues, end of quote. Um, so what's happening in the UK right now is basically the early stages of what happened in Greece 30 years ago. So what is interesting in the case of, of Albanians in Greece in, is in relation to memory and identity are practices that include religion shifts and name concealing. Um, so 
uh, in early 90s and 2000s, many Albanians in Greece adopted new Greek names. Um, Muslims uh, or even like Catholics turned into uh, Orthodox Christians. Um, so uh, there was in general um, a, a, a very perhaps unique assimilation uh, and adaptation of the Greek customs and culture. Um, and um, as, as researchers have, have showed in the beginning, this was basically becoming invisible was a strategy um, to survive. Um, and it was also an outcome uh, of the constant um, hate and, and racist rhetoric uh, that was produced uh, by the media. Um, as uh, uh, Gazmet Kamplani and uh, uh, my, uh, Nicola Mai write here, behind the violence with which Albanian migrants have been criminalized and stigmatized by Greek media, one can trace the resurgence of discourses and categories of exclusion, marginalization, and racialization, which were partially internalized as a residue of Greeks' own past experience of migration, exploitation, and hardship. In other words, because of their physiognomic and cultural proximity, Albanians reminded Greeks of their own near past of poverty, social unrest, authoritarianism, and immigration. In this respect, Albanophobia can be seen as a byproduct of the anxiety generated by the fear of having to regress culturally, socially, and economically according to a racialized or rather balkanized hierarchy of civilization. And I'm mentioning here like Greece because um, its own, I would say, geopolitical location is also interesting, right? So lingering in a way between the European identity, its own Balkan identity, but also like um, the, or, the history of um, or, or Orientalism perhaps. Um, so one of the most, um, I would say, like reappearing news also in the 90s and 2000s um, in, um, in Greek media would also be uh, the debate, for instance, whether Albanian students can, can be allowed to hold the Greek flag in national parades. Um, the tradition has it that the best student gets to hold the flag, uh, but the Greek society was quite awkward to accept that even um, Albanian students, so basically kids of immigrants, were able to excel at schools, um, and as such, um, were basically part of the of the Greek educational system. Um, um, this is also like evident by the fact that in many cases, um, second generation Albanians um, could not speak; they never learned to speak um, Albanian. Um, it is also important to note that currently it is the second generation Albanians in Greece who are working towards establishing and acknowledging the history and experiences of Albanian migration in Greece, um, something which has uh, remained invisible until the present. Um, and an example would be the recent establishment of the Albanian Photographic Archive uh, within the contemporary social history archives that involves second generation Albanians um, claiming to take a bottom-up approach towards developing their own narrative around their own memories uh, of growing up um, as kids of Albanian immigrants uh, in Greece. Um, and seeing these narratives also in relation to um, my own memories, uh, the common patterns and threads that appear allow us to speak of uh, a collective memory that was shaped exactly within the frameworks of being in between two identities, in between two countries, in between two borders, being the Albanian in Greece, uh, the Greek um, in Albanian. Um, and uh, while the media in, uh, in the UK have been uh, preoccupied with uh, the Albanian immigrants, um, for the past um, a month trying to establish and understand the reasons behind uh, the Albanian migration, the reality is that Albanians have been migrating for the past three decades. And this is more concerning for Albania itself, whose population is currently just a bit over 2 million, rather than for the countries um, they, they receive Albanian migrants. Um, so, so this graph here shows that Albanians um, kept migrating um, on, on a regular basis. Um, it is also interesting to note that 
the slight increase of uh, population coming to Albania in 2011 and 2012 are again related to the financial crisis in Greece, uh, during which many Albanian migrants uh, returned back to Albania. But this does not change the fact uh, that Albanians keep wanting to leave the country, um, always in search of uh, a better life. Um, and this is further, in a way, um, uh, highlighted in this quote by uh, Fatos Lubonia that writes, um, Albanians continue to live divided between the glory of their virtual world and the misery of their real world. One of the most eloquent expressions of that separation is a paradox in which, on the one hand, Albanians ex express their pride in being Albanians, um, considering um, uh, themselves to be natural superiors, uh, but then at the same time, they also escape from it uh, in search of, uh, of a better life. Um, so um, the collapse of state socialism in Albania brought the first massive way of Albanian migration. Um, Russell King um, and uh, Nicola Mai uh, write um, in this uh, in this quote that summarized in a way like the, the initial uh, waves, writing that uh, March 1991, so post Cold War Europe's nightmare immigration scenario, a flotilla of assorted craft crammed with some 26,000 desperate migrants fleeing political and economic chaos in Albania, bearing down on the coast of Italy. Five months later, in the heat of August, the same thing happened again. A further 20,000 arrived by rusty boat and flimsy dinghy. A third exodus of Albanians occurred in March 1997, consequent upon renewed political and economical chaos that hinged on the collapse of a set of huge pyramid investment schemes which bankrupted more than half the Albanian population." End of quote. So at a first glance, we can argue that the transition to neoliberal democracy and shock therapy of the socio-political reforms following the collapse of socialism not only cured the Albanian uh, economy, but rather it established uh, a perpetuated state of precarity that follows to this day. Russell Kings identified the three first waves of Albanian migration, but the reality is that, that migration from Albania never stopped. Um, the desire to belong somewhere to the progressed and prosperous Western economies, especially after the financial crisis in Italy and Greece, has forced Albanians even further to the West and onto the shores of, of Britain. Um, Albanian migration here follows the same patterns, mainly males would first take the dangerous leap, perhaps having already informal networks here who would be able to offer them jobs and then followed by their families. An element which further highlights the ignorance of the Western media when it comes to understanding um, the um, tradition, perhaps, uh, formations. Uh, researchers have also noted that um, Albanians have uh, renegotiated their, their individual and collective identities um, through selective appropriation, and they have mainly been, um, quote, I quote, consumers rather than creators of their own, uh, of their conditions of culture, end of quote. And I would completely agree um, with this. Um, something unique, though, which happened in the UK in the reaction to the discriminating media reports and that has not happened to countries such as Greece, uh, are collective acts such as the protests that took place in London in 2022 and the appearance of intellectual voices from Albanian academics and thinkers, which further shows that while the first wave of Albanian migrants fled the country with nothing but the clothes they were wearing, um, there are currently voices that claim agency and ownership over telling their own history of migration. Um, since uh, Albanian migration involves overlapping histories and generation, and it is an experience that nearly every Albanian family has experienced, I would argue that Albanian migration is accompanied by an intergenerational collective memory that has fundamentally shaped uh, not only the sense of identity and belonging, but also the collective memory around understanding and making sense uh, of, uh, of the socialist past, a past which to this day remains contested and difficult to articulate, uh, both in private and in public spaces. Um, and um, I also find like particularly interesting 
the, the memory of uh, the second generation Albanians. Um, and the work that I'm presenting here today is an ongoing research. Uh, and in the following stages, I'm planning to conduct interviews with second generation Albanians who grew up in countries such as Italy and Greece, and the financial crisis forced them to um, another history of migration um, in order to better understand um, the ways in which media news and references to Albanian migration um, are perceived by this second generation Albanians, um, affecting also questions of identity, collective, uh, identity and collective memory. Um, I also find interesting how, um, especially in Greece right now, we see the appearance of, uh, of second generation Albanians speaking up about what has happened in the past 30 years. Uh, and of course, this is also because um, they have different education or perhaps um, different uh, access to information that what parents had. Um, but I would also say that there is also um, an act of um, post memory to use Marianne Hirsch term. So maybe like a belated response um, to, to, to a history um, of, um, of, of racism that um, needs to be told in a way. Uh, to conclude, um, I would argue that uh, engaging critically with uh, current media representations and discourse can reveal more about the sociopolitical realities of countries that are um, um, in a way like producing, are in need of, of, of a scapegoat uh, or of a foreign other to justify its own crisis rather than for the migrant experiences um, and identities um, that in a way like remain still difficult and invisible uh, to capture. Um, there is also like an intense mention um, of, uh, of the socialist past um, by the Western discourse tends to omit uh, the fact that uh, before the socialist regime, uh, Albania was for 500 years under the occupation of the Ottoman Empire, and shortly uh, after it became an official colony of uh, Italy's fascist regime. So I think it's also important to acknowledge this previous history of colonization um, in, in the region. Um, and um, to this end, I find useful the suggestion posed uh, by Minolo and uh, Tlostanova, who suggest a theory that appears from within the borders um, and is able to acknowledge Western hierarchies, dominance, as well as one could argue our own positionality as researchers uh, in Western academia and universities uh, when it comes to making sense uh, of the former East and its post-socialist others um, in, in the UK. Um, and um, I find very crucial um, this, this proposition here of, uh, of, board, of a border thinking that needs its own genealogy, its own history, um, and all that needs to emerge um, in the very act of performing uh, border thinking. Um, so thank you very much for um, your attention. I think uh, I might have um, gone beyond my time limit. Uh, yeah, I look forward to the other presentations and the conversation at the end. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dimitra, for um, a fascinating and really very current and relevant presentation. I, I look forward to the discussion around it. Um, but first, I want to hand over to Charlotte and Marin uh, for their paper, The Role of Historical Memory in Media Narratives of German and Polish Migrants in Britain. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm just going yeah. to uh, share the screen, but uh, we'll first hand it in to Maren. Um, yeah. Is that okay? okay? Yeah, it's there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you um, for the introduction. Our paper is called The Role of Historical Memory in Media Narratives of German and Polish Migrants in Britain. And as Sarah has said, this is one outcome of our research project, Post-Socialist Britain, uh, in particular of the media strand where we study the portrayal of um, post-socialist migrants and their histories in British media. And we focus here on German and Polish migrants and memory discourses. 
Uh, and the paper is a work in progress and we're still trying to find the best formulation of the title and the research questions, so we welcome feedback. Um, but the research questions as we have currently formulated them. Um, can you show the next slide, uh, Charlotte? Yeah, exactly. So how do British news media portray German and Polish migrants and how does this interact with historical memory? of Germany and Poland, and what can this tell us about constructions of British national identity and the inclusion or exclusion of migrants and transnational memories in it? So, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, to set the context, what do we know about the portrayal of Poles and Germans in British media? Well, firstly, there's a lot more research on the portrayal of Polish migrants than on the portrayal of German migrants in the media. And it should be noted here that while Poles are a larger group of migrants in the UK than Germans, Germans are actually quite a significant group of migrants, but their presence is hardly ever problematized. So previous research has found that Polish migrants in the British media have been subject to moral panic, have been presented as a cultural threat, um, so actually quite similar to what Dimitra uh, presented also about um, Albanian um, migrants. Um, Bulls are also often represented as cheap, hardworking laborers. And then recent research has explored the racialization of Polish and other Central and East European migrants as not quite white or not white enough. So they find themselves in an in-between state between white privilege and racial discrimination. And then finally, recent research has also pointed out that the impact of the post-communist transition on migration is erased in British media. So the historical background of their reasons for migration is not taken into account, indicating a potential disconnect between migrants and their histories in public discourse. And as I've said, there are, there are actually no studies on the portrayal of German migrants in British media that we are aware of. And we interpret this as a reflection of the general white and Western European bias in perceptions of migrants. So white Western European migrants are generally treated as unproblematic in both the media and in academia, and Germans are uh, treated as West Europeans um, in spite of the post-socialist um, history of Germany. Um, uh, there is research on the portrayal of Germany as a whole in British media, which shows that Germanophobia has been central to British media discourse, uh, in particular in the Eurosceptic media and the Brexit discussion, um, whereas there's uh, not much research on the portrayal of Polish history in turn. So there's a um, yeah, difference in focus. And can we go to the next slide? So with this background, we want to explore the connection between memory and migration in the media. So it's well established that media act as memory makers, that the construction of memory narratives is central to the construction of national identities. And that also means constructing who's included or excluded from a national community, for instance, migrants. Um, but it's also important to draw attention to historical amnesia, where inconvenient aspects of history, in particular colonialist relations between the center and the periphery are forgotten and the impact erased. And the racialization of migrants from post-socialist Central and Eastern Europe is influenced by the history of East, unequal East-West relations. But this fact seems to be subject to a similar historical amnesia. But on the other hand, um, migration might lead to um, what's been called mnemonic contestation, so migrants challenging established memory narratives through their own memories. So we want to see how this plays out in the case of Polish and German migrants in Britain. Next slide, please. So um, in order to do this, we've analyzed articles from the most widely read online newspapers, so Guardian, Telegraph, Daily Mail and Daily Express. Um, and we've performed separate searches for migration and memory narratives uh, connected to Poles and Germans in different time frames between 2014 and 2019. And we've used a narrative approach to the analysis, focusing firstly on how Poles and Germans are characterized 
and secondly on how um, memory and historical events are implanted. Um, yeah, so what we found with regard to Polish migrants is broadly in line with previous research. Poles are portrayed as a mass of low skilled workers, um, so also this focus on numbers. Uh, after the Brexit referendum, hate crimes against Polish migrants are widely discussed, but typically Poles are characterized as victims, while Brits are characterized as heroes helping them. And Poles are constructed as ethnic minorities who are marked out as different in line with previous findings on their racialization as not quite white. And then um, German migrants, by contrast, um, so as I've said, they are not mentioned much. And when they are discussed, they typically appear as white, middle class, and easily assimilated individuals. So in this context, Nigel Farage's um, controversial statement that you know the difference between Romanian and German neighbors appears actually as representative of the differences drawn between West and East Europeans um, in British media on the whole. And we found two examples which are particularly striking in this context of racialization. So firstly, there was a case of a German who is raised in the UK, who is portrayed as obviously British in Mail Online and Express articles, which decry the fact that the same rules which are applied to all other migrants are also applied to her. So in these narratives, Britishness is clearly constructed um, not through legal rules, but uh, through racial, class, and gender criteria. And then secondly, we found one case where a German doctor is presented as negligent and dangerous. Um, and this goes against the typically positive portrayal of Germans. Um, and it is one of the few cases where we find the German marked as non-white by referring to his Nigerian descent. So that, again, underlines the racial hierarchies at play here. Um, yeah, so neither Polish nor German migrants are typically brought into connection with their country's histories, but there are a few examples where history is part of the narrative, and these are particularly instructive for the characterization of Brits uh, through migration narratives. So firstly, some articles portray Poles and Germans, and here in particular Merkel, who's marked as an East German, as valuing the EU's freedom of movement due to their communist past, where they were not able to travel. And the implication is that Brits are different because they do not need the EU to guarantee their freedom. And there are also narratives of the British support for Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany, highlighting British tolerance and openness. And these narratives are then sometimes used to paint political opponents as un-British for not exhibiting this um, tolerance, for example, by advocating Brexit border closures or also um, criticizing Corbyn for being anti-Semitic. Um, so overall, Brits are presented as heroic, fighting for freedom as a tolerant nation. And through this characterization, um, the racism which does exist in Britain, um, which was exhibited in particular during the Brexit debate, um, is being um, denied. Uh, yeah, and then I will hand over to Charlotte, who will focus more on the um, historical dimensions of our analysis. Uh, thanks, Maren. So um, because we found uh, that um, Polish and German migrants in, in our um, data were generally kind of dislocated from um, their um, histories and kind of the historical reasons for uh, migration, we wanted to look at how um, broader kind of memories of Germany and Poland were narrated in, in the UK media to understand the kind of um, discursive context that um, German and Polish migrants are existing in, in the UK. Um, so um, looking at the narrative um, um, element of employment, we found a uh, a number of different kind of um, uh, types of narrative um, in relation to German and Polish uh, history. Um, the first were kind of um, 
historical comparisons with contemporary politics um, in a way that served to um, reconstruct ideas about British national identity. Um, so the first um, that um, was quite um, uh, dominant, particularly um, in the run-up to the um, 2019 general election, was and and obviously in the in the right wing press in particular, um, a discrediting of the British left by a memory narratives of um, East German state socialism. So Corbyn is portrayed um, as wanting to recreate the GDR in Britain. Um, for example, one Daily Mail article states that Corbyn intends to rerun the East German nightmare in 21st century Britain by abolishing private schools, empowering unions and shortening the working week. Um, there's also focus on uh, the so-called woke young generation, which is portrayed as forgetting history or not, not having experience or lived through the Cold War, um, which is showing out in the so-called ca cancel culture, particularly um, on university campuses. And we have uh, kind of terms such as the campus thought Stasi uh, being brought into uh, connection with this. Um, there are relatively few articles generally in relation to um, Poland and Polish history. Um, and when they are, they often kind of, it's kind of Poland being um, um, brought together more broadly um, in articles about Eastern Europe. Um, uh, but there are a few that um, similarly in relation to um, the kind of idea of the woke generation and cancel culture, uh, some mention of the intellectual dissidents in communist Eastern Europe, who are then compared with conservatives in Britain today who are also facing what they understand to be witch hunts. Um, there's then also some um, articles that um, compare um, the uh, communist and Nazi oppression of Poland um, with what the EU is doing um, in relation to Poland or Central Eastern Europe. So here we see Poland um, constructed as a historically uh, a victim of um, uh, in these sense, but also presently in relation and um, particularly to EU um, refugee policy. Um, so what we see here are narratives of Britain coming through uh, as liberal, as inherently free um, and kind of committed to objectivity and free speech. Um, um, we then have uh, um, some narratives which emphasize historical continuities that are shaping perceptions of Germany and Poland. Um, and there's a very strong uh, media focus on the idea of uh, a rise in the far right in Germany. Um, uh, they talk about generally kind of far right um, violence, such as the um, uh, attack on a synagogue uh, in Halle uh, and other events, um, the shooting of um, the um, politician um, Walter Lubke. Um, uh, as well as success for the AFD in state elections and European elections. Um, but this is very much understood um, as an East German phenomenon um, and attributed to reunification. Um, so we have this kind of idea of Germany as kind of still Nazi, um, but, um, but this is really seen as something that's specifically attributed to the East. Um, but we do also have some um, uh, quite a few articles that talk about the populist right um, in Central and Eastern Europe, particularly in Poland and Hungary. Um, and this is then also framed in, in the um, uh, context of post-communist transition, which is seen to have led to resentments um, that's led to support for, um, for the um, populist right. Um, but in both of these kinds of narratives, um, fascism, the far right, um, is constructed as a specifically European or German problem that is external to Britain, something that's caused by pro-socialist transition with which um, Britain really ha has nothing to do. Um, and that also then kind of creates amnesia around the idea, uh, the existence of the British far right and also connections between the British far right and other European far right movements. Um, and then finally, there are also narratives of what we've kind of called memory wars. Um, and this is where articles about Poland uh, appear um, the most, um, and particularly focus on articles that 
um, talk about the um, Polish leadership, the Polish government's kind of battles over memory. Um, in particular, this idea that um, they are um, denying Polish anti-Semitism or uh, any kind of complicity in the Holocaust. Um, but then also this is um, a theme that comes up also in relation to the, the far right in Germany and the idea that there are kind of German failures in remembering. Um, so the idea that the AFD are denying or downplaying the Holocaust. Um, and also there's a kind of series of articles that report on German organizations, German companies not taking Nazi plus, the Nazi past seriously by using, inadvertently using kind of Nazi symbolism and things like that. Um, and then also some idea that there's a lack of engagement with Stasi crimes. Um, so in both of these narratives, you have an idea, uh, uh, kind of a perception of both Poland and Germany as um, authoritarian and um, oppressive. Um, so just to summarize, overall, we find that uh, media characterizations of Polish and German migrants have created racialized hierarchies of Europeans that are, however, um, historically formed um, with certain themes connecting uh, past and present. Um, and there are, there are uh, memory narratives that reproduce ideas, particularly about British liberty, um, about um, Eastern European backwardness, and this kind of um, uh, historical amnesia around the British, British far right. So we'll stop there. Great, thank you very much. Um, although we all work on the project, it's actually really nice to hear what's happening once we're out of the project because we don't always catch up perhaps as much as we should do. Um, so thanks very much. I look forward to the discussion. Um, so uh, our final paper is uh, by Spela uh, Dronovšek Zorko um, on the topic of towards a post-socialist politics of presence. Um, thank you, Spela. Thank you very much. Sarah, bear with me just a moment as I try and see which window I put my PowerPoint in. Right, can everyone see that? Perfect. Uh, hello everyone, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you and it's especially a comfy position to be in to follow on from these last two papers because uh, uh, they've given, well, given me excellent ground to, <laughs> to come in and um, perhaps I can blitz through some of the context I would otherwise have had to spend more time on. Uh, so really looking forward to what's coming out of our discussion. Uh, for a start, maybe just to explain a little bit the, uh, the background to, to this presentation. So for the past five years or so, I've been working uh, in various ways on the topic of what it might mean to think about post-socialist migrants in the UK, um, in particularly through the question of uh, the way that so-called Eastern Europeans position themselves in uh, regimes of race and discussions about coloniality and post-coloniality, which in Britain are so absolutely linked to the question of migration and have been for a very long time. So uh, what I'm about to present is, is one of the ways that I've been trying to get into the question of what it might mean to, to think about postness as, uh, as one of the encounters between post-socialist and post-colonial memory in the UK. But when I say memory, it's of course very much also about the present. Um, so uh, the, the present that I am focusing on today is this idea of uh, presence in, uh, in the sense of an um, immigration that is historically conditioned. Uh, now, many of you may be familiar with the term, we're here because you were there. Uh, it, this is a, a quote that's largely attributed to Ambalavanu Sivanandan, a Sri Lankan born writer and activist, uh, but it was taken up as a rallying cry by a whole generation of post-war uh, anti-racist activists in the UK by descendants of uh, former imperial citizens who were turned into migrants by a series of successive legislative acts. And uh, it's also the title of a recent book by Ian Sanjay Patel, who very beautifully describes uh, post-war immigrants as 
uh, the insinuating ghosts of the colonial world that somehow um, make, it, make it impossible really to deny the British imperial past and challenge the separation between domes domestic British history or the history of Britain as an island nation from its imperial history. And we can think, you know, in broader terms about this idea of the past in the present uh, and the politics of presence in the British public sphere, especially over the past few years, there's arguably been a real, um, a real boom in, and of course also real contestation around the politics of colonial and imperial history. And, you know, when, when you see an organization like the National Trust, um, be decried as a as a woke and um, as a woke organization, you you know that something is happening in the UK now that perhaps wasn't quite imaginable about ten years ago. Uh, and of course, uh, we see it in discussions about the toppling of statues, about claims to decolonize education, to decolonize museums and other institutions, uh, claims for uh, reparations, slavery, which. Uh, have been repeatedly and are still being ignored by the British government. Uh, you've had a lot uh, written as well around the time of uh, the coronation of the, the slight perhaps thawing in the monarchy's uh, willingness to acknowledge colonial crimes and the legacy of slavery. So there, for example, you have the then still Prince Charles, who did make a reference to the historical evils of slavery when he attended the inauguration of Barbados as an independent republic. But he has also been criticized for not actually taking any steps towards reparation or uh, trying to, yeah, to, to enter into a politics of restitution rather than mere acknowledgement. So just not to spend too long on this, uh, this is not to say that it is now commonly accepted that uh, Britain uh, committed colonial crimes and that it has restitution to make. It's, uh, of course, there's been a lot of backlash. However, even in the discussions around Brexit, there is, there is a sense that what you know, Paul Gilroy has called post-colonial melancholia played a significant role in the idea that Britain needs to, to tighten its borders, to go back to a previous time when it was uh, comfortably culturally and racially homogenous. And you know, it, it's been discussed by commentators in multiple ways why that is a particular myth, and why that is a myth uh, rather than rooted in any uh, actual historical reality. However, has that happened in any conceivable way? for what we might term post-socialist or Eastern European migrants. I, for a start, would like to go back about 12 or 13 years or so to what became known as Bigot Gate. Uh, it was actually just before I first came to the UK. I remember following this discussion still from Slovenia, where I was living at the time, and, and knowing, uh, even not having that sort of instinctive sense for British politics yet, knowing that this was going to be um, uh, a, a big issue in the election. So what happened was that the then Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, on pre-election um, trail was asked by a pensioner uh, about these Eastern Europeans. These Eastern Europeans, what are, what are coming here? Where are they flocking from? Uh, it, it's a particularly evocative phrase, I think. So. Uh, it's, it's one that's stuck, but it also became, I think, uh, seen as a milestone for, for immigration suddenly becoming a mainstream issue for voters, but also becoming something that um, was deemed impossible to talk about, right? So the, the culture war that we're seeing today is in some ways also connected to this culture war, supposedly, around, oh, uh, we're not allowed to talk about immigration. And if we are, then we're seen as racists. So Vilichkovic, when talking about this incident in a recent article about representations of Eastern Europeans 
in Brexit, or Brexit literature, says that in a way at the time, the term Eastern Europeans didn't really uh, raise any alarm bells. So she writes, replace Eastern Europeans with German or French, and it would be clear where they are coming from. Or replace Eastern Europeans with Muslims or refugees, and the liberal alarm bells would certainly not fail to ring, as they did in the case of Eastern Europeans. In other words, she's saying that, at least in 2010, Eastern Europeans were not intelligible as just regular Europeans, as French or Germans, who have a clear genealogy, everyone knows where they're coming from. But they were also not yet, I would say, stigmatized as dangerous foreigners. Now, as we are all sadly aware, that was soon due to change. And um, yeah, both the previous presentations went quite into depth about uh, the, the media uh, stigmatization of so-called Eastern Europeans. In fact, the con construction over time in public and media discourse of Eastern Europeans as a category. As a category that nevertheless rarely really engaged with post-socialist migrants as an idea. So what I would say is quite interesting in terms of recent debates about the racialization of Eastern Europeans in the UK is that there is a sort of presumed problem of whiteness, of what to do with whiteness as a starting point. Uh, and of course, how the discrimination faced by people who are uh, in many cases seen or perceived as white uh, how that relates to perhaps longer established and deeply rooted post-colonial racisms, as Alyosha Tudor calls them. Uh, one quite interesting approach which, uh, which grapples with this question from, from the perspective of, uh, of the Irish communities in the UK is taken by Ryan and Hickman. And they, they say that they, they compare the experiences of Irish Polish and Romanian migrants, which they say are not easily explained using the black and white dichotomy, which they claim has continued to underpin sociological analysis, migration, race and ethnicity in the UK. Now I put a little footnote there because I would say that uh, that is a partial reading of the sociological literature on the subject. There is a flourishing scholarship um, uh, recently, especially on race and racialization of Central East European migrants that does take it beyond black-white dichotomies, as well as other traditions, um, including a Satnam Verdi's work on the racialized outsider in the UK. But nevertheless, I think Hickman and Ryan do interesting work in, in the sense of bringing up the fact that the Irish are often not thought of as post-colonial migrants, uh, even though they, of course, uh, of course, their racialization and their, uh, their stigmatization in the UK is deeply linked to the colonial relations between Ireland and the UK. So if we can compare Eastern European migrants and Irish migrants along one axis, that is the idea that they are well, a disposable um, army of labor on the one hand, but also that they are generally seen and perceived as white and therefore pose a challenge to black white dichotomous understandings of discrimination. Is there any way that we can also think about the historical lens on Eastern Europeans? That's where, sorry, that was a rather long introduction. Uh, and only now I feel like I can take you into what, uh, what insights or some of the insights that I've had from my interviews and conversations with migrants from various parts of um, Central and Eastern Europe. So some of the questions that I want to throw out just for us to think with as I show you and share with you some of the quotes over the next couple of minutes are the following. If there is no such direct uh, colonial or history of colonial domination between the UK and the countries of Eastern Europe, uh, and you know we can leave aside for the moment uh, those debates that do seek to position a kind of colonial 
relation. Let's for now just talk about the kind of direct colonialism that is in play when we're talking about former colonies and former parts of the British Empire. In the absence of that sort of history, what alternative politics of presence might be asserted or considered relevant to so-called Eastern European migrants in the UK? And to take Patel's phrase, what diverse forms of postness might emerge in the overlapping plural combinations of place, experience and encounter? So when those socialist migrants are also exposed to the kinds of claims to presence made by post-colonial migrants, what, uh, what relations, what effective stances, what comparisons, what solidarities and what hostilities might emerge from that? And of course, how, how do people think about uh, the, the effective import of remembering or not troubling historical connections is the last question. So this quote is drawn from a conversation I had with a community organizer for uh, Eastern European communities in England. And this person was in fact uh, making the Irish comparison as well and saying that speaking to uh, uh, Irish community organizations and activists, they have found that the Irish were in a similar position to Eastern Europeans for a long time. Also white, they were nevertheless considered inferior. But apparently the Irish government then invested very heavily in promoting Irishness and promoting Guinness and music and so on. And it worked, but they glossed over any history, any trouble. And so I went on to ask whether the UK Irish relationship uh, was also influenced by the fact that Ireland was the first British colony. And uh, my interviewee responded, Yes, they still see their former colonies as closest to them somehow. Whereas I suggested Eastern Europeans will always be foreign. Yes, exactly. So this idea that you can establish good relations um, by glossing over history or trouble was very interesting to me, uh, as was this agreement that uh, there is a sort of colonial intimacy that comes with having been subjugated uh, even if that is perhaps an unwanted intimacy. Something similar was echoed by another interviewee who comes from former Yugoslavia. Now this person was talking about um, a situation in which they were the only quote unquote foreigners at a particular event, apart from a group of South Africans, white South Africans, who my interviewee did not perceive as truly foreign because they were former colonial subjects. Uh, and she was, um, I think she had a sort of sense of humor about that, but this point was, was made very seriously. To quote, to me, somebody from South Africa is not perceived probably in the same way as somebody from Eastern Europe, who's got this funny accent and is from some back of beyond. They've probably never even heard of Yugoslavia, whereas South Africa is kind of, there's history there. We were there, we of course being the British Empire. They're ours, that kind of thing. Whereas we're not. So there's again that sort of assertion of colonial intimacy that structures relations between uh, Britain and migrants who come from the Commonwealth or from other parts of the world that Britain had subjugated. And then this person sort of went on to say, well, you know, we're from Eastern Europe, they don't even know where we're from. They probably think we came from behind the Iron Curtain or something. And this is a common refrain as well among many uh, interviewees from the Yugoslav region, the idea of, oh, they thought that we were, you know, Soviet satellite, Yugoslavia had a different history, um, pointing to this complete ignorance, supposed ignorance on the behalf of British people about the histories of different parts of Central and Eastern Europe. Now, this is a very long quote, and I don't, I'm not going to read all of it out, but uh, I did highlight some pertinent quotes. Because whereas the previous two interviewees do, uh, do repeat the idea that there is no real direct historical relationship between Britain and the countries where they come from. Um, in fact, uh, that is at the core 
of um, of the the sort of complaining about ignorance. Uh, in this quote, my interviewee from Poland still talks about British people's ignorance of history, but very much makes the point that there is a clear historical connection between Poland and Britain, one that gives rise to feelings of uh, of grievance, perhaps, or at least of unease. So they're talking about, um, first of all, they talk about Poland being a victim, which they believe it was, but also talking about things that Polish have done wrong. For me, she says, that's justice. We were colonized, but we also have an anti-Semitic past and present. We're racist as a country, we're sexist, we're biphobic, transphobic. But then at the same time, she goes on to say, you know, many Polish people are really cool. We have solidarity, we have good points to history and bad points of history. And in the same way, you can talk about Britain having both good and bad points to their history, both a strong union tradition and a colonial history. And then specifically talking about uh, Polish people in the UK, she says, there are prior connections and they're weird because Poland looks at Britain in the Second World War a little bit like an ally and a little bit like a failed ally. There is an invisibility to this whole relationship and I find that interesting and annoying as a Pole. So there's also this, this imbalance here, right? So as a Pole, she's very aware of, um, of, of the fact that uh, Britain, as she says, let Poland down twice. Uh, but in her view, most British people don't know that at all. I don't think about it. Um, some British people remember it, but not many. That was buried a long time ago, symbolically buried. At the same time, there are Polish soldiers who married into families here who stayed after the war. So they're there. It's there, this history. A quiet minority, a white one, you know. But it's always been there. And then finally, because I'm aware that I am rapidly running out of time, uh, we can also think about what, what we might term a sort of neo-colonial um, relationship being expressed by some interviewees. So I had a conversation, a passing conversation with an acquaintance from Croatia. He was talking about the brain drain of young Croatians to the West, including the UK. And he said that, you know, while he liked the EU, there was a downside to the EU that wasn't discussed very much. The fact that Western countries can very easily take, choose to take educated and talented people, uh, like doctors. Um, for example, he mentioned a doctor he knows from Romania who could only earn about 800 euro a month if he lived there, uh, but coming to the UK was better. And then this person went on to say that this is as bad as, or maybe even worse, than what places like Britain did in the colonies mining and taking resources from the ground, and so on. So this is, uh, in many ways, not a particularly unusual argument. But it is, I think, interesting in this case that you have someone who says, oh, they're pro-EU, they like the EU. And yet, um, you know, we have to remember that Britain is, has a colonial past. I mean, has done things like this in the past. It's just doing them differently now in the form of um, stealing talented people from European peripheries. So I want to just very briefly wrap up some thoughts and maybe um, throw out some things that I would love for us to discuss further. I think what I see in these quotes is a, a desire to stay with the trouble. First of all, to ask why don't more British people know where Eastern Europeans are flocking from? That's something that's come up again and again in my interviews, uh, in my interviews, in my um, casual conversations, in my discussions with artists who are, are trying to um, to represent, but not in stereotypical ways, where they come from. And then the next question, and the one that maybe interests me most, is how is it possible to work towards acknowledging um, both plural and overlapping histories of postness in the UK that don't pit post-colonial and post-socialist migrants against each other. And then finally, where does the post-socialist dwell in, in some of these quotes, for example? Because the, you know, it might not be very obvious what's post-socialist about um, the person who was referring to post-war or rather the World War II 
historical connection and the, the responsibility that she implicitly felt Britain owed to Poland. Uh, and yet it's there also in, in the fact that uh, most, uh, that the majority of Polish people in the UK came later, so after this event, which you know, she saw as being precipitated by Britain's failure as an ally. This whole historical period, which has now completely disappeared from public view in Britain. So I'm going to leave it there and hopefully we can talk a bit more about some of these things. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, that was fascinating and those questions I think are exactly some of the questions that we're also wrestling with in the project. So um, it's really great to have um, new perspective and, and particular interview data sounds, sounds fascinating. Uh, okay, I'm gonna, we have 10 minutes exactly for remaining for questions. Um, I'm gonna open up to the, the floor first. Uh, feel free to raise your hands um, uh, virtually probably given the number of people in the room. Um, and uh, and or put something in the chat as well. Um, I'll just give people a, a moment to do that. Uh, yeah, Christina, would you like to kick us off with a question? Hey there, can you hear me? Okay, great. So firstly, thank you all for the very insightful presentation. Um, I do have a question and I'm gonna pose it for the presentation that Dimitra delivered. So I found it really interesting, this uh, basically comparison that you made between the racializations of Albanians in the recent uh, border panics blasted by tourists and affiliated media in the UK and compare it basically with the uh, xenophobic narratives in the Greek media. Uh, personally, as an Albanian scholar and working on the securitization of Albanian male asylum seekers in the, in the UK, um, I'm interested to know your view on um, regarding the potential role of war on drugs as overarching ideological lenses uh, activated by these different immigration receiving countries where basically um, Albanians notably have massively uh, uh, immigrated there. And basically how um, there is this, you know, commonality in constructing Albanian immigrants as criminals and basically constituting uh, the later as a security threat. Yeah, thank you. Um, before you answer, Dimitri, I just see if there's any uh, any other questions, immediate questions, so that we can collect them. Does anyone else like to add a question? No. Okay, then um, go ahead, Dimitri. I think sure people are thinking. Thank you very much for uh, for this uh, question. So the main reason why um, I I remembered in a way Stuart Hall's work, especially on how mugging was so much related as a street crime basically to, to, to black immigrants that were coming into the UK at that time um, is because I would say that something similar is happening is happening or has has been happening for the past 30 years like because yeah we have like the appearance in the UK media but this has been going on in Italy and Greece and in other countries so um, it's it's exactly like creating in a way a panic um, and um, perpetuating some uh, these narratives uh, by connecting um, Albanian immigrants with uh, um, gangs, uh, uh, drugs. Um, another interesting, um, um, you know, like extremely frequent phenomena on, on Greek media that happens even nowadays, um, when there is like a news report on, on a crime that has happened, uh, whenever um, the perpetrator would be Albanian, that would be explicit on the news. So it would be like 30 year old male Albanian committed this and that. But when Albanians are victims, that doesn't receive um, the same space. And actually there was a very, interesting um, example just a few years ago uh, when a whole family was basically murdered um, and media they never like they didn't reveal the fact that basically it was an Albanian migrant that was murdered by a far-right uh, Greek person so there's always like this uh, manipulation in a way of, of a narrative um, which I think is the main reason um, behind uh, the identity formation of Albanians in Greece, such as, for instance, forgetting 
um, the past, forgetting uh, the, the parents and grandparent language, adopting Greek names, because assimilating and, and in a way receiving this new culture meant also um, becoming part of that society and being avoided and avoid, um, avoiding in a way to, to uh, become um, targeted. Thank you. Um, are there any more questions in the room? Oh yeah, Jenny. Hi, um, thanks for uh, all, all these presentations were super fascinating. I, I will just keep it to one question since we don't have much time. Um, it's for Spilla. I It's really interesting your paper and I was wondering about your, uh, kind of about the research setting or the research strategy that you have because I'm wondering how present that connection between the two posts is in your interviews or whether you have to somehow elicit it and if so how you do that without you know like putting something there that isn't there so how how conscious are people of the idea of the postness in different ways and and also have you done um interviews with what you might call more post-colonial migrants as opposed to post-socialist ones that of course that that uh, means that you have to categorize people but I'm just wondering, you know, what's, how much is it there and how much are we as academics kind of, you know, it's a very abstract idea in a way, right? Uh, how much are we putting it out there? Thanks. Thank you very much, Jenny. Yeah, that's been um, central concern since I started with this research in many ways. But this particular project um, came out of my PhD project, uh, which was sort of more broadly on post-Yugoslav uh, intergenerational memory in the UK. And uh, at the time I was not expecting, I was quite surprised to, to have people um, spontaneously reference, uh, not always of course, but in certain contexts, reference um, sort of Yugoslav anti-colonial past. Uh, you know, the idea that Yugoslavia was in the non-aligned movement, uh, that it was at least rhetorically in solidarity with decolonizing nations. And this tended to come up in situations, I thought, where people felt a bit aggrieved at the UK and how they were being treated here as, uh, you know, as, as a group who saw themselves as European and modern, and these are words that came up and were suddenly not being treated that way uh, in the West. And that got me really interested actually in what kind of other connections were being made uh, as people were navigating this question of, wait, what are we in the UK? You know, are we, <laughs> are we white? Are we European? What does it mean to be neither of those things? Are we sometimes this, sometimes that? And so uh, I, I went in recruiting very broadly, uh, you know, anyone who wanted to talk about these things, but I was quite upfront actually that I was interested in um in questions of what it means that britain that we talk about britain as a post-colonial place what does it mean to be a post-socialist migrant because i wanted to have more of these conversations with people who maybe had thought about it to help me think through it myself uh and for the most part that that worked quite well because uh people often said well yeah you know you you can't help but notice this and this and this. So even if they don't necessarily always use terms like post-colonial, um, there is, and this is what I'm thinking about now in when I use the term postness, there is a sense of, oh, there is a historical, an unacknowledged or under-acknowledged history there uh, in relation to uh, basically all the migrant populations in the UK. And I think the more that people felt alienated um, by the kinds of media discourses about Eastern Europeans that you know we've seen come up in all the presentations, the more these things came out, and the more um, you know Britain was seen as a place that had a lot of problems <laughs> due to the past. So I'll just leave it there for now. Thank you. Um, I'm going to finish off with one question for everyone, um, which. So you kind of alluded to it, um, Shmela, in your paper that there is this kind of growing literature, at least academic literature, around racialization of um, Eastern Europeans and 
um, kind of Karl Marx's term of Eastern Europeanism, which I sort of find in some ways quite useful. Um, that seems to be, I mean, it's a, a resurgent moment. It's not, I mean, it's been there before, but I, it feels like there's a moment when there's more and more literature being produced around this. Um, I think for all three presentations, do you think that's a discourse that will break through into the mainstream? Because it's not, it's not one that in, in from my perception anyway, seems to be in the mainstream and it doesn't seem to be um, in the media that Shara and Maren were talking about. I, 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 you mentioned racialization, Dimitri, but I, I get the impression that it's not, not necessarily something that's discussed around um, the way that Albanians are represented. Um, and Shabara, I had the impression that you were saying it's there in the academic literature, but not necessarily in the way that people are talking about themselves. Do you think there will be this movement from the academic literature into the mainstream? Is this something that we're going to be discussing more easily um, in five years time in, in the public sphere? I don't know who wants to go first. <laughs> I get a pick on Charlotte. <laughs> Of course, you pick on me, so of course, when you're the first. Um, uh, yeah, I was just um, uh, trying to formulate my thoughts. So I, yeah, I'm not sure because even, uh, I mean, in the in the right wing press, you have a very explicit racialization of Central Eastern Europe. So we, um, you know, there are articles that kind of talk about Polish communities within the multicultural city. Um, and kind of talked about as one community amongst many of the multicultural others uh, in Britain. Um, uh, whereas in the um, Guardian, which is the um, kind of main, more left liberal uh, newspaper we looked at, um, it's obviously quite different and there's a more sympathetic uh, approach to uh, to migration, but you you still have this discourse of um, kind of modernity having come to Eastern Europe after after 1989, um, which I don't think is yeah that doesn't seem to be a lot of consciousness that that's what's happening in in that press. So yeah, I'm not not too sure um, how that will play out. I don't know if Myron has anything else to add. <laughs> um, well, what I was thinking about was the, immediately the discussion around Diane Abbott and her remarks. So mm -hmm. I think I'm not even sure if we would want this race discussion to go into the mainstream because there's a lot of differentiation that you have to do there and it's not necessarily happening in um, public debates so yeah um maybe if yeah maybe maybe the use of a term like eastern europeanism is more is more useful in that sense because it avoids this is racism against eastern europeans the same as racism against uh, people of color so yeah i don't know if the other speakers yes Shvela. Just very briefly, I uh, found it interesting that actually lots of the people I spoke to did feel like they were grappling with this in their daily life, like what language to use, you know, saying, oh, we're white, but still. So there was, uh, I think there is a growing sense that there is a language that is missing and that um, that could be developed with nuance and, um, and good faith. And as we know, that's not always <laughs> in plentiful supply. So I, in a way, I'd say uh, we are already seeing, or we did at least shortly after Brexit, right? Some mainstream media reporting on racism against Eastern Europeans or even racism against any Europeans in, in ways that sometimes felt unhelpful because they did, you know, it's, um, create a dichotomy again of it's either racist or non-racist collapses um, all these different <laughs> histories. So I'm maybe not super optimistic about a nuanced debate, but it is something that people are thinking about. Yeah, um, Dimitri, I don't know if you want to add something. 
Yeah, I completely uh, agree uh, with um, these previous opinions. Um, and I also, uh, I'm not sure like how helpful things would be if they go to the mainstream, exactly because opinions get manipulated. Um, but I want to, to say that um, I was very positively surprised to see like immediately, even intellectuals and academics responding um, to, to um, um, in relation to uh, the Albanian migrants, for instance, because um, in, in Greece, for instance, that never happened. And it kind of shows uh, a shift in the background, perhaps like education or um, even like, um, it also says about the society in, in Britain as well. Like for instance, there is an Albanian school here in London, something which in Greece would be unthinkable of, for instance. So I think there is like space there for, for conversations. Um, and I think, um, again, like when it comes to, to, to Albanian immigrants, it would be helpful to also bring this in relationship to uh, post-socialist um, histories and the rest of Eastern Europe, because I think there are like many useful bridges and, and similarities there that um, might might help to 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 make further contributions. Great, thank you. So on this optimistic and also open this towards collabor collaboration approach, I think we can we can conclude this uh, webinar. Thank you everyone uh, for coming in and particularly to our speakers uh, for three fascinating papers that I, I think really advanced my thinking as well. So um, do come along to the next one, which is, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, Charlotte, but it's on May the 19th um, between 2 and 3.30. Uh, yes, so next Friday, not Thursday, but same time. Next Friday at the same time, so British summer time. Um, so uh, if you've already registered, you may have already registered that for that event, but if not, then please do uh, register via the link uh, on the DMSA poster um, and, and we'll make sure that you know how to get connected. But thank you everyone for coming. Um, and thank you very much.